Hello, I'm Yvonne Ashton, and welcome to our October episode of Mornings with Mayish. Amy Belsters of Amy Nicole Floral join me to really dig into bouquets. She gives bouquet tips for efficiency, chats about her favorite bouquet ingredients, what to avoid, and even shares her biggest bouquet fail. Visit her blog for the show notes or to watch our video replay. Stay tuned for the next show and keep on sending in your floral questions. Thank you so much for having me and I'm sorry for technical difficulties. That is, is. that's life, man. It's, it's life. It's, you guys are going to see me type and everything. This is so weird. So just ignore me and, and pay attention to Amy's side because she yeah. looks beautiful oh, and together. I put on makeup just for you, Yvonne. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's not, it's a few and far between the days that I put on makeup anymore, but we're here. Right? Um, <laughs> awesome. Well, you keep working there on getting tech support stuff. I will introduce myself for anyone who um, hasn't heard of me or doesn't know anything about my story. I'll try to keep it quick, but as Yvonne knows, as she has interviewed me before, brevity is not my strength and I love to talk. So we're going to try to rein it in today. I um, love it. So, <laughs> uh, my name is Amy Bolsters. My business right now is called Amy Nicole Floral. I'm in the middle of a major rename rebrand that I'll be launching at the end of the year, which is so very exciting. But um, I've been a florist since 2001. Um, I started um, at Golden West Floral Design or the Golden West College Floral Design Program in Southern California, where I'm originally from. And I found that program just by way of another sort of random floral design class I had taken when I was 19 years old, many moons ago. Um, and just from that very first class, you know, with the leather fern and the pink mini carnations and the big block of oasis foam, um, and, you know, and the terrible, like, you know, light, overhead college lighting, um, that very first class, I was super hooked. And I knew that this was really my medium. I loved the tactile nature of move, moving around and making something with my hands um, that incorporated the arts and nature, two of my great passions. And so, you know, I, I had dabbled in so many other areas before that. My mom was and is a really gifted artist. And so she, I mean, she could do anything. She could sculpt, she could paint, she could draw, she could do it all. And so, you know, I sort of paled in comparison to her growing up, you know, I was like pretty mediocre at a lot of things. You know, I just, I wasn't the worst. I certainly wasn't the best, uh, but it wasn't until I found floral design that, you know, that sort of, um, that fluttery heart moment of like, oh my gosh, this is my thing. This is this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I feel really blessed that at that at a young ripe age where you know I was very confused about life at that time, a little disoriented, had made some bad life choices, <laughs> and kind of gave up my dream of like you know honor roll, college scholarship stuff. I just was kind of lost and. Um, having found floral design, I tell people all the time, you know, it sort of saved my life. It kind of put my feet on a path of like just total obsession, really. <laughs> you know, reading every book, going, read, get, subscribing to every trade magazine, going to every trade show, um, and and then getting an education. So the, the Golden West program was a two-year program um, in floral design and shop management. It really gave me all the foundation that I needed to start working in the floral design industry pretty early on. I had only been in school for a couple months when I got my first job working at a little bucket shop on the side of the street, just scrubbing buckets. You know, we weren't really allowed to touch flowers. You were like, you know, the, the, <laughs> the grunt workers, you know, <laughs> and, um, I'll never forget the first time I was trusted to make an arrangement. And it was like, I actually thought of it recently the other day. I made this terrible tropical piece. <laughs> I, it was okay, but it was like, you know, lots of ginger and it was just lots of swirly tea leaves. And I was using, you know, showing off all my flair I'd learned in floral design school so far. And I remember I was so inefficient, you know, I took every stem and sprayed it, you know, with like the, the glossy finishing spray before I designed with it. It took me like 40 minutes to make this like, you know, $65. This guy was waiting for it and he was just looking at me like, oh my gosh, get it together. Who is this like kid making my range? Um, but it's those humble beginnings, you know, of just grinding it out in the backs of a lot of shops on holidays and eventually getting into the special event industry and that really becoming my home um, 
I worked in the high-end wedding and event business for a lot of years as a professional freelance wedding production, just, you know, five, six weddings a weekend, just grinding out. Um, and I worked all over LA and Orange County, really got to experience some really amazing things. Um, and then moved to New Mexico, followed my family out there and started my own business out there. A um, couple of things in between happened. You know, I kind of left the industry for a little bit, worked in corporate America for a few years, dabbled in some other areas, but I always came back to flowers. And um, now back in 2012, started Amy Nicole Floral, um, really had no idea how to run a business. I had always run production for other people's companies and um, all new world to hire and manage labor costs and you know, had a new baby, was doing like 25, 30 weddings a year and was just in huge demand in New Mexico because I was doing garden style back then, uh, very like lush, textural, boho garden style, which was like nobody else was doing really. So it was like I was getting all these, uh, just a lot of work and didn't have the foundation to manage that well profitably, burned out really hard, really fast, um, made a lot of mistakes, lost a lot of money. Gave a, did a lot of free weddings for people <laughs> through over ordering or feeling like, oh, right. I can't do that. You know, I've sort of been through a lot of the, the struggles of a lot of floral designers through whether freelancer or business owner or running of somebody else's, you know, business. So I come from a wide range of experience and um, it's really helped me now as a, as a coach and as a teacher. Um, because now I really only do floral design education. I teach and I do courses and I help people one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm able to draw from this well of so many years of experience, not, not always successful, you know, but a lot of painful mistakes and a lot of frustrating um, faulty situations that have taught me so much about how to better now run my own business and also how to help others. And so I, um, as an educator now, I just find so much purpose. I feel like the 17 years that I was doing flowers have prepared me for these last two years of teaching and going forward, I'm able to just continue to draw on all these unique experiences I've had to help other people in their journey, which has been really kind of one of the joys of my career. Um, I thought I had kind of like Oh, you know, you kind of hit this place where you're like, I've kind of done a lot and I've seen a lot, I've hit a lot of sort of benchmarks. And the next sort of frontier is now passing off a lot of my knowledge and experience to other people and celebrating their successes now. So that's really the new stage for being Nicole Floral and my work and my life. So I'm excited today to talk about bouquets because I know how challenging they are for people and I've been through the trenches with bouquets. <laughs> so one of my favorite questions my friend submitted is about failure. <laughs> I think that's so important to get off the Instagram reel and talk about the real, the real deal of, you know, the failures of our work, because they're actually what forms us and makes us better and makes us tougher, stronger, more resilient designers. So yeah, yeah. thank you for having me. I'm just super excited to dive in. Of course. Am I echoing to you? Okay. I'm getting my other computer started, oh, so I'm going to switch awesome. in a second. Cool. Yeah, while I'm doing that, can you talk a little bit about your bouquet tips for efficiency? Absolutely. So um, so efficiency in making bouquets. So a couple of things. I'm just going to rattle off a whole bunch of tips for you. So I'm going to think about this as if I'm teaching a student or talking to one of my students. I'm just going to give you all my good insight. Okay. So the very first thing in being efficient in your bouquet process is the ordering. As unsexy as that sounds, sourcing the right ingredients for bouquet is truly more than half the battle. The assembly of bouquets gets a lot of attention. Um, you know, there's a lot of people teaching now and there's a lot of information out there and a lot of different ways that people make things but really successful bouquets start with the right ingredients and not every ingredient really belongs in a in a bridal bouquet right and that's the context that we're talking about today is making bridal bouquets not market bouquets or maybe for a photo shoot although these techniques work for that we're talking about having to bust out some wedding bouquets. You need to work efficiently because you got a lot of other stuff to make. And so very first thing you need to do is have your sourcing lockdown. 
what does that mean? It's a much longer conversation, but should I keep going? Okay. Keep on going. Okay. I'm going to keep on going. <laughs> this is nothing, by the way. I spoke at Team Flower two years ago last year, and the fire alarm went off during my presentation in front of 300 people. Oh, wow. It went off four times. That's so crazy. Yeah, you keep just ignore me for a minute. I'm going to get all settled and I should be squared away. Okay. I'll just keep plugging along. Okay, yeah. so the first thing you need to know is to make sure you get the right ingredients, right? If you're going to make a loose and airy bouquet, you have to have some linear elements, right? You have to have some dynamic lines. You have to have things that bend and move. If you only have static line flowers, right? Straight up and down, horizontal, vertical flowers, really hard to get gesture and movement. So by sourcing the right material, um, there's a process, but it, you know, by getting the right stuff, that's going to be, that's going to do the heavy lifting for you. Because uh, once you get into your studio and start assembling it, you've essentially solved the problem, right? You've already solved those design problems ahead of time. So sourcing, sourcing, sourcing in terms of efficiency. The next thing is really practical. Um, feed yourself. <laughs> um, if you haven't eaten anything and your blood sugar's crashed and you are like, running on fumes, trying to make bridal bouquets, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle because they're challenging. You know, you're, you have to solve so many problems when you make a bouquet. Physically, mentally, your brain is working on overdrive. And so if your blood sugar's in the tank, um, you're going to have a harder time solving that problem. So make sure you have something in your body. Make sure that you're hydrated. Try to minimize distraction. So you can set your team up to be doing production on something else. Or you've got kiddos. You need to put them down for a nap or whatever it is that you can do to minimize distraction to really be able to batch work on bouquets, I find is really a major efficiency driver. You're able to produce more effectively when you yourself are protecting that space and you are thinking straight and you are feeling good. Um, and I know that that's a lot to ask for wedding days, but listen, I've abused myself for a lot of years in the namesake of flowers and it's just not worth it guys. We just don't need to ruin our health to do flowers. So stop what you're doing and go eat a dang banana. Okay. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Right. Take care of your body. Yeah. We can't just be drink coffee and have a donut once every 12 hours and think we're going to do our best work. We got to take care of ourselves. So, um, you know, being in, being in the right physical state, um, buy an anti-fatigue mat to stand on also in your studio. Make it a little bit of a space in your area, in your garage or wherever you work um, so that you're comfortable, your feet aren't hurting, you know, get yourself physically prepared. Quick mental note too, right? So mentally, and this all ties into efficiency because we're not just robots, we're people that are designing. So we have to bring our whole self, mind, body, and soul to the bench when we make something, which is why I talk about all these things. So the other thing you need to do is set your mind right. If you are stepping into bouquet making, telling yourself, that you are bad at making bouquets, if you start that process by saying, oh, this is the worst part of my job. This is going to be a fail. This is going to be such a flop. I hate it. She's going to hate this. I don't even know why somebody hires it, right? We got to rein it in. <laughs> yeah. Right? You got to coach ourselves in that moment and say, and do the opposite. So tell yourself exactly what you would tell one of your designers. You got this. You're going to nail this. Our mindset, it has to go before we succeed in anything. And so you can have control over that, even if you're struggling. Um, I have used this for years in my business. It radically changed my life to change how I spoke to myself. And it really started helping me be a more... Um, effective designer because I wasn't beating myself up at the past before I even got to the work. You know, I was right. getting into it with a, with a stronger mind and um, taking care of myself mentally. It really does make a difference. I encourage you to, to start with that as well. Um, practically speaking. So once we got our head on straight and we're fed and we're hydrated and we've minimized distractions so we can batch work, um, we want to work efficiently as possible in production in assembling bouquets. What this means is you want to gather all your material. Okay, it's so inefficient. I've watched people work over many years, and you know they're running around their studio. Oh, I need a rose over here, and oh, shoot, my vines are in this bundle, and I haven't even processed, and they're ripping off rubber bands. 
one hand's got the bouquet, you know, the phone's ringing. It's like, trust me, I get it. No judgment. <laughs> no judgment. I, I get it. But also, like, we can set ourselves up for a little bit more success by being a little bit more organized. I will be the first to admit I'm not the most organized person. My house is usually a bit of a mess. My studio is a bit of a mess. I'm not, like, the tidiest person, you know. And I'd love to blame it on artistry. It's I'm just really lazy if I'm honest. <laughs> I'd rather do fun things. Like, that just feels so boring to, like, do those things that matter. But if you can tidy up your process, you are going to be more efficient. And I'm going to tell you what, you're going to make more money because you're going to have to fix less problems that come up. And you're going to be more efficient. You're going to see your family more, your friends more, because you're not going to be working till three o'clock in the morning on weddings. You're going to be done at a decent hour. So it's worth the front end to be prepared. Have the vases that are the price bouquets are going in cleaned you know, without a sticker on the bottom, without dust and weird bugs that have died in your studio, right? Have them cleaned and ready and prepped full of water. You can do that three days before the wedding if you need, right? Fill the water the day of, but have them cleaned and ready. Um, oftentimes we act like we are just, oh my God, so much, but we can do a lot of this grunt work and, and work ahead of time to minimize the amount of, of stuff that comes up on actual production day. So we want to protect that production time so, so well. Okay. So get your material and you should have a stem count. I really, really believe in this. Even if it's a loose idea, five roses, right? Seven this, two of that, six of these, right? Just a general idea so that you're ordering properly and that you're designing efficiently. Pull your recipe, pull the best of the best that you have and separate them. I like to separate them by base. So I'll get all these little cylinders lined up and I put a bucket down below each one of them. So I put all my fragile stuff, my sweet pea, my estrangia, my little bits that are that are gonna get crushed if they're laying on a table or things that don't like being out of water. Those go in my vase and I put everything else in the bucket below. So everything is a matching thing, okay? So, you know, my greenery, everything's ready to go. So I'm setting myself up for success. I'm cleaning as I go. So I'm making sure every single ingredient is stripped down. Almost two thirds of the of the stem is clean. I only keep about a third of the top of that stem. Everything in your hand should be clean, as if you're designing it into a vase. So no foliage, no stem, extra stem chunks. I have a little saying that a lot of my students sort of play back in their head, but clean, 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 right? Clean yeah. stems, and not because I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so tidy. There's a practical reason why you have clean stems. Not only does it eliminate bulk and weight, but in the spiral technique, which we're going to talk about, you must be able to move that stem up and down, side to side, and twist as you design so that you can build layers without crushing other stems and it getting trapped in the center of the hand. So there's actually a reason why cleaning, cleaning, cleaning is so important. So we're cleaning our stems as we go. We're making sure everything's lined up nice and clean. And then you want to throw, get into your production mode. Put on your music you like. You get in the head game. You're fed. Your mindset's ready. You're going to bust this out. Um, I used to go for making bouquets in like an hour because I was just so in my head about it and not taking all my own advice to making them in 10 minutes. Like, Wow, we can, we can we can do this, guys. That's amazing. <laughs> I've had students tell me, you know, that it was taking them over an hour to make one bouquet, and they had seven bouquets. Guess guess how late they were up to twenty or thirty minutes using these techniques. So really important stuff here that we're we're doing. We're giving you your life back, right? We're giving you your time back. We just cannot get that. We cannot buy more time, right? So once you're all cleaned and prepped and ready to get into production mode, you go through and you put everything into a spiral. And I will preach this to the day I'm in the ground. That make it, knowing how to make a proper spiral bouquet is critically important. Um, I don't care what style you're making. Making a proper spiral is a foundational floral technique that is going to save you time, money, energy, product, your hand, your arm, straining, all of it. Spirals are so incredibly important, and I don't, you know, I think that baby's gotten thrown out with the bathwater so often with people that are like, oh, that's an old school technique. It's absolutely not. It's foundational to success. So I throw everything into a spiral. I throw a rubber band on it. I throw it right in front of me in a clean vase that's right in front of me. Then I come back, 
and I judge. <laughs> and I judge. I need, I need judging. Yeah, I need a little <laughs> um, this is that editing. This is that finessing, right? So I cut the rubber band off and I really start to study. We're building my implied line, focusing on the outer form, building and if there's any issues with, right? And most of the material should be in there because I've gotten it all in the spiral. I may pull my more fragile bits and layer those in at that point if I feel like that's best. But depending on the style of the bouquet, this is a very efficient way to make bouquets. So it's a very long answer. <laughs> but my most important piece of advice, if you take one little tidbit, you're like, God, you talk so much. My one tidbit. <laughs> But I want you to hear loud and clear, write this down and print this on your head and heart, okay? It's two words, really. It's called batch work, right? Clean every vase at the same time. You're, over, but you're, you're cutting down your movement around your studio and distraction. You get all your vases at the water, you clean them all at the same time. You do all your fern, you process all your fern, pop, 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 pop. You clean all your stock, pop, 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 and separate it in the recipe. You clean all your roses, pop, 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 right? And this process makes you so efficient. And this is a great job for not you, right? right. You can give this job to somebody in your studio, um, a helper, somebody you're hiring. Make sure that they understand, you know, what you're doing, but, um, you can come in as the designer and in an hour have all that stuff done, right? So you can make this a very efficient process. If you're running late on time, do this process, throw everything into a spiral and do the judging in the morning. When you're fresh, when your head is ready, when you've had, you know, you're on a good night's rest, then you can kind of solve some of those trickier problems, but at least you're not starting from scratch. So uh, this, these processes, what I'm talking about, this stuff has been life changing. And I don't mean like, oh, I'm amazing and I'm changing life. I'm talking about <laughs> foundational floral techniques that are changing lives for florists that haven't heard this stuff before and have been muddling through the hacks, things they've watched on an Instagram live once that they thought was like a correct technique, or you know, they're they're just like, I've what have I been doing? <laughs> I'm over here. This is taking me what? And I'm breaking stems and I'm doing, you know, it's like, oh my gosh. So we're really talking about foundational stuff. This isn't trend. This isn't my Amy's hacks. This is, this is what you learn, you know, in the first few weeks of floral design school. So that's, um, it's a really long answer. I'm sorry. We're not off to a good start. <laughs> you know what? It, it's, it is. It's okay. I'm, I'm going with the flow. It was a beautiful answer. I, I'm set up. I'm feeling better now. I'm not sweating anymore. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. That was my long answer. I got no, it. <laughs> it was, it was so good. And guys, again, yeah. my apologies. I really don't like being late. And, and, and Amy was talking about being prepared. I feel like I'm a very prepared person. Yeah, and so when this cool. stuff happens, it like really freaks me out. You, know, you have some grace for yourself, Yvonne. I get, I didn't tell you guys, Yvonne sent me this document before this call. And I was literally telling my husband in the kitchen. I was like, I've never seen somebody so organized in an interview. Every detail, every link was there. I mean, you are like the your goals, Yvonne. Your goals. So you're allowed I'm to trying. have a I'm trying. So it makes me feel really good. I'm going to do it publicly in front of everyone. So good. <laughs> you're supposed to grow in that. Who knows? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, no, but I think that was really great. Batch work, I think, is so important. I, and uh, Huntress Florals, hey, girls. Um, yeah, batch work is life. Yeah. I love it. Um, let's move on because we have, by the way, we got so many great questions, um, from all of you guys and um, the base questions from Amy are really great too. So that the next question is, what are your, some of your favorite bouquet ingredients to include in those spirals that you're creating? Yes. So this could be a long answer, but <laughs> try and keep it short. <laughs> well, we're going to, I'm giving you like three minutes to answer girl. <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> here's, my, here's my best answer. My favorite bouquet ingredients are line flowers. Line flowers, things that have a linear quality, things that have gesture movement. We're talking vines, um, ferns, hellebores, sweet pea ranunculus. Small headed blooms in bouquets allows me to transition colors and shapes. So if I just use a lot of peonies, a lot of large roses and a bench hydrangea, right? I don't get as much textural interest. I go right. from large shape to large shape to large shape. So smaller ingredients and smaller lines, medium lines, smaller lines help me to blend. That's my answer. 
Look I at love that. it. Look at that. That was less than three minutes. So I'm bad. so proud of you. Thank you. I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, we're growing together. <laughs> growing today. <laughs> Um, okay, what are some red flags for bouquet making that you are suggesting people to avoid? Yeah, so being disorganized is one of the biggest red yeah. flags. If you're just going to wing it, you're going to struggle. And I think you're going to end up, you know, a lot of people can just kind of wing it and they make it work. But I don't think they're producing their best work. And it's probably taking them longer than they need. And they're probably wasting money by either overstuffing bouquets or not producing what they really promised that client. So being organized is one of the biggest red flags. The other thing I see is just major overstuffing, overstuffing, overgreening. Uh, I I tell students that overgreening is a crutch. It's often they're using it as an armature to hold things in place. But then what happens is is that the more green you add, the more you throw off the ratio of flowers to greenery, and so your bouquet just ends up getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you're like, ah! And so you're and then you have a quote hole. And then you're stuffing and it just sort of becomes this sort of the train has fully derailed, right? Right. So overgreening is is really the start. Those first five, 10 stem insertions, whether you're designing an arrangement or a bouquet, are really foundationally important to making good bouquets. Um, another thing I see is like over taping, over mechanics, threading. You know, when you start shoving flowers in the center of a bouquet, that can be okay, but um, oftentimes this leads to breakage. You're putting counter pressure on the stems. And so by spiraling your stems, you're really protecting that. I can squeeze a bouquet that I've spiraled really hard and not break a single fragile stem. So uh, threading and over taping, I see a lot of excess mechanics being used. You don't need to be taping your bouquet every few stem insertions. That really limits and adds Bulk. It limits your ability to make that, you know, build those highs and lows. Um, you're kind of locking yourself into place, but also um, you're adding excess weight and bulk to the handle. So what happens is you hand a big, you know, tree trunk to a bride and she's got these two hands to hold it. There's a, there's kind of something not quite happening there. I also right. don't want a bride to cut open her bouquet to hang it dry. And she's got to go through layers of tape to get her stems out of there. It's like kind of mummified, right? A uh, spiral technique fixes all of that. So very minimal mechanics are needed. Um, the least amount of mechanics possible is always the goal um, to get the job done. Very good. Good stuff, guys. Um, and I'm seeing some questions coming through. As we're talking, go ahead and keep on adding those questions to the comments, guys. And um, hopefully we have time to answer them. Hi, Christina. We have so many great people here today and we're, we're over 70 live. Ooh, Hi guys. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So we always get questions about pricing all the time. Um, can you talk about how you price your wedding bouquets and, and do you have a minimum when you're, when you're doing that? Yeah. So this depends so much on where you live because we do not price the same depending on where you live. It's just what the market can bear. That's just part of running a business. So don't, uh, please don't like send hate mail. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I'm never. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start. Um, okay, so pricing is is of the same. I consider you know pretty standard three and a half, four and a half, five time markup depending on if you do a 30% labor cost, if you have a design fee, like there's so many different people that teach different things. And so right. for my business, I lived in, well, I've lived in three different places, very, very like poverty state with like very low budgets to very high end to back to more like mid budget. So I've kind of done a little bit of a little bit of it all. Um, I find that 85, 75 to 85 range for me feels good in that bridesmaid range. That gives me enough to sort of work with, you know, and get some quality product in there. 250 up to 375 for a bride feels about right. Again, there's a huge range here. If all I'm doing are greenery bouquets, I'm going to maybe do that at like 200, 195. I might even go down a little bit. If she just wants a bunch of herbs, because again, they're they're not just paying for the product, right? They're paying for your expertise and how to make it. Right. Um, but also, if I'm not putting 40 stems of Phalaenopsis orchids, that bouquet is going to cost different than, you know, a sunflower bouquet. So we have to, you have to use a pricing model that works for you. I love Curate. Um, I think they do a fantastic job at 
really allowing you to figure out what your real costs are, what you're comfortable with in terms of everybody's costs are different in running their business. So as much as, as important as industry standards are, at the same time, you know, you know what you need to make and hopefully you know what you need to make. So you need to figure that out and then price accordingly. Very good. Thank you. Um, I see a question here from Brooke. She wants to know if we have any videos available on bouquet making technique using the spiral. I don't know if we do, surprisingly. I'm going to have to go and look. I don't know if you do, Amy. And I know mm -hmm. you have, you'll be talking a little bit about kind of your, your bouquet boot camps, I believe. Oh. Um, so I'm sure you'll talk about that technique. But um, yeah. basically, I have a YouTube channel. It's a two and a half, three minute video on how to make a spiral bouquet. There you and go. A lot of people, they'll send me DMs like, this video is so helpful. <laughs> I walk you through it. If you can't afford a course with me, you don't want to deep dive, um, or you don't have time to invest in your education, you just want to watch a quick video, it's really helpful and just teaches you the basics. It's at Amy Nicole Florals, the YouTube channel. I have about 25 videos on there, all covering very basic floral design things. So you can find some really helpful things on there. Yeah. And for us, I'll definitely add it to our list because I honestly, I we have bouquets on there, but no one's done like an actual spiral. So at least that I can remember because we have, we have like you know five hundred videos on our YouTube channel, and they're making a spiral. That's, <laughs> uh, it's crazy that we should have that. Um, all right, so let's dig in more to these questions we have one from that came in via email from rebecca and then we had a bunch of like very similar questions that kind of support this so rebecca says what is the best way to construct a wide low organic looking bouquet that many brides want i have trouble with the mechanics and the flowers often end up close closer together than i want um and then similarly we have questions that say um, how do I keep my bouquet loose and airy? How do we, how do you make your bouquets wide? How do I keep the airiness in once I've binded the stems? And again, another one about keeping the bouquets wide. So what say you, Amy Nicole? <laughs> You're going to hear me repeat myself and I apologize. <laughs> no, I'm, it's good. I'm going to answer these pretty much the same way. The spiral technique, the spiral technique, the spiral technique, the spiral technique. Spiral this technique, people. Answer, you guys, <laughs> this is the answer, I promise you. So I have a lot of students come to me that have either very little experience or a lot of experience. I have the full range. I've got the whole scope. And I have had people say, I've tried the spiral. It doesn't work. Or that doesn't really work for me. Or I'm left-handed. Or, yeah, I prefer it this way. Or learn one time at a workshop this way. And I've just been doing it this way ever since. I'm going to tell you to go back. Go back. Go watch my two-minute YouTube video and practice the heck out of it. And become an absolute master of this technique. And what you're going to find is that you can make... I'm going to put this on record, Yvonne, stamp the record, time stamp on this. You can make any style of bouquet in a spiral. Open form, closed form, loot, tight, big. These enormous bouquets you see that are like, you know, I call them like installation bouquets because they're like so big. Right. Um, you know, editorials, kind of what we call them, fashion bouquets. These can be made in spiral technique. In fact, they should be because you can actually manage all those stems. Again, when you spiral and at this, I, I don't mean to like proselytize or sound like I, you know, I'm just on my, my soapbox. Let me just really quickly tell you that for many years, I got a little bit derailed in my own bouquet making process. I will say very derailed. I came from roundy moundy, Europe, Euro chic, balls of things. That's what I did. Our early 2000s designer, that's all I made over and over. That was a luxury industry, right? Over and over and over. When this style emerged, when I opened my business and I was like, oh my gosh, this speaks to me. This is what I want to do. I didn't know how to do it. I was like, I don't understand how they're getting this shape. I don't get it because all I'd ever made was a round form over and over and over and over and over again. So I really struggled standing at my kitchen sink, really frustrated. And I was a trained professional designer. So if you're struggling, join the club. All right. I'll get off my train in just a sec. I promise. I went in and took 
all these workshops from people I admired. And I did learn some things. I did learn. I picked up a few things. But this D-Ray, I'm going to be honest, a lot learning from a lot of different people who are like <clears throat> doing all these different things with bouquets really threw me off because I'd go home and try them. And I'm like, this isn't working. They must have some magic to what they do because it's not working for me. I couldn't replicate it at home. And so one day I'm standing in my studio, very frustrated over here with this crazy mix mash of stem with breaking things. And I was just like, I'm dead. And I thought, you know what? I'm throwing this into a spiral because that's that. I'm just, I need to get this bouquet out the door. I'm running out of time. And I got to tell you, that is when the uh, light bulb popped up out of the top of my head. And I went, oh, the answer has been here all along. I need to spiral this. And then within the spiral, there's technique you use to build out the form that you want by raising and lowering, twisting, turning stems. So there are these adjustments we make in the stem and in building implied lines and focusing on the outer perimeter so that we don't get this round ball or round ball with antennas or arms, but it's in material selection, huge, huge, huge. I keep going back to that. It's in the materials you choose. You cannot make a loose and eerie bouquet with a bunch of big, heavy round flowers. Right. You have to have smaller gestural lines, smaller headed rows, little, little round things to build from the base of that bouquet up. And then you're foundation of it is in a spiral. So again, this is a much longer conversation. My bouquet course is like six hours long. Right. So I, you know, we can't, it's not exhaustive in this conversation, but I want to say there are answers for your frustrations and they're in the spiral and stem selection and you don't have to be frustrated anymore. There are actually answers to this. Um, and I would love to help you figure it out, but yeah, that's, that's really how you get those big wide organic thank you so much um yes girl get it um that's what they're there for i my youtube channel is to serve you it's to teach yep. you it's i'm not making a penny off of this, this content it just lives out there because you know i want to teach it i want to share what i know so go um go watch it and grab some stuff out of your yard and start practicing and practicing and what happens is you start building new muscle memory it starts to make more sense so do it over and over and over and it gets easier and easier and easier and things start to connect they start to click and connect and you're like okay 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 i get so many dms from students they're like i i see the light now <laughs> i see the light like i'm making these in 20 30 minutes now thank you so much so um yeah it's the, it, there's answers i promise it's good, good, good. And if you guys who are maybe listening to the replay or listening to the podcast, I um, did include the YouTube link to Amy's spiral video. I will also have that link up on the show notes for you guys on our blog, um, along with um, putting it in the podcast description too for you guys too. So good, good stuff. Thanks for the video, Amy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And the answer, someone was asking, like, how do you make a spiral? So now, now there's your answer. So good. Good stuff. <laughs> Love videos. Okay. Our next question comes from Judy. She says, when ordering flowers for an event, how much extra do you order to account for breakage and damage? Yeah. So Judy, I'm super cheap <laughs> and I don't want to, I don't want to over order on breakage and damage because that's literally my profit just down the drain because as right. a woman event florist you can't resell that product right you're going to end up using it or giving it away or something so my my flat answer is like five percent sometimes three <laughs> percent i know some florists that order up to eight to ten percent overage i think this is a long answer and i'm going to try to really tr like rein it in here it is it depends on what you're ordering i do not do a flat over order on every single thing because if i'm ordering boxwood I could have that in my non-cooler for a month, right? I don't need a need to overorder. I might overorder on Estrancha and Hellebore and certain types of very wilt-sensitive material that I know I need a lot of, okay? Now, I'm not taking the hit on that. If I have to overorder to make sure I get my 10 full stems of Japanese anemones or my little juicy caviar is what I call it, um, I'm building that into the cost of what I build a client. So I'm not over ordering and just like to save myself. I'm going, I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose three stems of hellebore. I, that means my stem price on how I build my recipe has to be higher than just an, on, based on an average five or 10 stem bunch, if that makes sense. 
So it's really dependent on individual STEM. Software like Curate or one of the other softwares, there's so many of them, find one that works for you. If you can't afford it, just start doing it by hand, but really figure out what STEM count is and build that all in. And that's going to help you learn as you grow. I don't know how long you've been doing it, but as you get more comfortable with floral flower conditioning, you know just how to save some stuff. And you also learn how far you can push certain material. And I keep looking up because I'm looking at these dying Cosmos on my counter, right? Some of them look great. Some of them look dead. I had them out of water for like three hours yesterday. So Cosmos are, you know, if I'm going to get them from a local farm, I know they're going to be tough. Same with Dahlia's. If I'm having something on a sh plane shipped to me, I know I'm going to have more loss. And so you start to gain more confidence in what exactly you need to order more of, and it does take a little time. Really learn your care and handling. Mayesh, I, I refer people all the time to Mayesh's website in the Flower Library. The Flower Library, I use it constantly for ordering. I use it constantly for inspiration. Um, they have really great information. They're always updating it on their conditioning. So you can go to their Flower Library, go look at Strelitzia, Bird of Paradise, right? Go look at what it says. It gives you detailed instructions. Low sugar solution. This is tropical. Don't put it in the cooler. This is how many days it'll last, right? It gives you great information. There's great books on care and handling all this stuff helps you minimize how much you need to over order which is going to eventually save you money awesome thank you for the shout outs i'm yeah. sorry it took me a second to reply because i'm cop i'm like pasting all these links that you're you're bringing up so <laughs> curate is amazing um they they just sent a link for you guys because they're oh they're amazing they're always they're always coming and checking out what we're doing we love curate um you know but amy did said if you can't afford it do it create recipes some other way like and creates more than just recipes they do so much so much so much it, so just check it out if you guys don't know about them um but we do we develop like a, a very generic product planner recipe thing um it has it's brand new and we're going to work on some some more features for this tool, but it's part of planner. You can create recipes um, and it separates it by bouquets and bridesmaids and you can just make whatever you need. Um, it's really cool. And then you can send a quote to your sales rep makes it super easy. And again, saving time, trying to be as efficient as possible. So big. Um, so we're definitely working on that. Um, she brought up also the flower library, Amy. So thank you for that. And so our flower library does have a lot of great information. It has availability in terms of the processing piece of it. Uh, we don't have that information in that all with everything, but we do have an amazing um, care and handling guide that's in our educational downloads page. So I have all those links guys for you. I'll make sure to include them in, again in the show notes up on our blog, um, but in the educational downloads, we actually have a brand new one about our dried and preserved stuff. Cool. So um, a product guide so that we can download if you wanna share with your brides and things like that and have something beautiful to look at. We have that. We have a garland guide. We have reliable products for large scale design. It was created by Sue McCleary. It's amazing. Um, again, the flower care guide. We have a rose guide and a seasonal product availability guide, along with our Mitch experience. If you want to just get to know us more, but hopefully you're here and you know you know all about us. So that one's probably the least interesting one for you guys. So check that out. Lots of great stuff. And uh, it's good, good. Okay, our next question is about wiring. Mm -hmm. They want to know, is wiring flowers a thing of the past for bouquets? Not even a little bit. I wire flowers all the time, all the time. In fact, when I was doing more in-person pre-COVID, um, I pretty much taught wiring in every one of my in-person classes because the thing is that, that wiring flowers is not an old school technique. Wiring flowers is... is the whole point of wiring a flower is simply to remove excess weight and bulk in a step and to add flexibility. Those are the two reasons why you wire something. So if I want to use an amaryllis, which I love using in bouquets, they are like my jam. Um, right. If I want to put an amaryllis, I am not going to put a stem that's like two inches 
pick and easily crushes in a hand tie or try to shove it in through an armature. That would be insanely ineffective. <laughs> so you have to take it off and wire that bloom into a bouquet. Same with a lot of orchids. I, I love using um, orchids in bouquets. And so whether you're using a phalaenopsis or different types of orchids, the cymbidiums are really strong and I use them all the time to come in great colors. You need to wire, you're not gonna put a giant stock of 14 headed blooms in a bouquet. And if you rip off all the bottoms of that cymbidium and all you have are these top ones, what if you want orchids in other places? You have right. to wire them. You can't, what, how else are you going to get them in there? So, wiring is so not a thing of the past. Um, it's very, very important. Again, foundational floral skill to know what gauge of wire, how to properly use floral tape. I do have a YouTube video on how to properly tape flowers. I don't get into wiring a lot, but I have a lot of friends who teach courses on that. Uh, Team Flower, Sue McCleary, these are all good friends of mine. And they all have great wiring courses you can check out. Um, yeah. Talk through how to do different stitches and how to do different techniques. Um, but if you don't know how to use floral tape, um, that's really, a, you know, can be really challenging. So go check out the video for that to just learn. Get a Get a thing of, you know, from your wholesaler on floral tape and get some rose stems out of the trash and practice over. Watch Netflix and practice over and over and over. And you get really good at it and efficient wiring technique. So use it. Good. Good. <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it. Um, and I love just your emphasis on how these things aren't old techniques. They're Ooh. really great um, mechanics that everyone should be learning if you're in the floral design world, which is, I think, just so important to kind of reiterate and echo. All right. Our next question is specifically about spiral bouquets. So... Um, someone asks, there's a few questions. How do you work in stems that mess up your spiral, like curvy branches? Um, someone asks about, do you start with greenery, then flowers are alternate? And then someone talks about how her old lady hands get so cramped up when they're trying to make spirals. Can you help her? So lots of, lots of good questions about spirals. So the first one's about how do you work in stems that mess up your spiral, like curvy branches? Um, it depends. So if I have, for example, the first thing I think of is like bittersweet. Um, I try to choose a stem that the top of it might curve, but that any stem below where my hand is holding the bouquet is as straight as possible. If it is curving, I would just lay it right into the spiral as anything else. It can be slightly more challenging, but it's still going to hold together. Um, I oftentimes will cut above or below a really weird bend or sort of twist in that stem to really keep it contained. Towards the end, when you're doing your final zhuzh, right, when you're fi getting that final finessing, you know, don't over wrestle stems that are really bendy and wiry in too early in the bouquet. You're just going to drive yourself crazy. Get the foundation of that bouquet made, then get that really windy stem really tapped into where you want it. And there's several things that, that I can, you know, that I might do. I might twist, I might wire it. I might, you know, force it into a piece of greenery to really anchor it. And then I would go ahead and finish that bouquet off, making sure that it didn't move around. So I've done this before at the end of a bouquet when I have something really sort of drapey, passion vine or some kind of vine that I'm trying to kind of wrangle or wrestle. Um, you kind of want to deal with it last if possible. Um, what was the second question? The second question was about, I lost my place. Um, on a spiral, do you start with greenery, then flowers, or alternate? Yeah, great question. So I would say the answer to that is that it really depends. Um, I often prefer in my bouquet making to have a lot more flowers in the center and sort of have the perimeter of the bouquet be the greenery. And I'm not talking about, you know, in traditional floral design, more Western style, we sort of use this terminology in vase arranging or in uh, designing arrangements to green it up. I don't necessarily agree that in bouquet making you need to green it up. I do think though that you need your woodiest stems first. So to answer that question, you want to use your heaviest 
stems, whether that could be roses, that could be hydrangeas, your woodies, right? Whatever those woody tougher stems are, you want to get first in your hand. Just like in vase arranging, right? We're, don't, we're not designing into a mechanic. And so we have to create an armature in our hand to allow things to sort of hold together. I'm going to give you guys a piece of advice that might be really, really helpful. When you start a bouquet in the spiral, you are going to feel like it's not working until you're 20 stems in. Okay, don't give up. <laughs> don't throw it down and be like, that girl totally didn't know what she was talking about. Okay, you, you're not there yet. You got to get it more in your hand to then be able to start making some design decisions about where things are going to land. I never start a bouquet and, and it ends up in the same situation, especially with loose and airy bouquets. I say oftentimes in my classes, it's like a dance, right? I place the flower moves. I don't freak out, right? I, I, it's a dance between me and the, the rhythm and the movement of the bouquet. I'm in charge. You're the boss, applesauce, right? <laughs> but I don't do it. I don't freak out when things start moving around. You got to get right. enough in there. So get 15, 20 stems in there first, then go in with your finishing bits and, and really start building it out. But um, that is my best advice. Is it necessarily starting with greenery? You just need to start with whatever's the heaviest, hardiest stems. Very good. And what about um, old lady hands, which I have, by the way, I can like really carry anything. I have to use a wagon every time I go to soccer, even if I'm carrying like one chair, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, so I've had a lot of, I have a lot of students come to me that for flowers are a second or third career. They're in their fifties or sixties. They might even already be developing some, you know, some arthritis. They might have some issues with their joints or they have teeny tiny hands. I have students with teeny tiny hands. Yeah. Um, I have to get everybody, right? So my best advice to you, if you're saying that the spiral technique is causing fatigue in your hand, I'm going to probably push back and ask more questions about how you're holding it. So let me give you a little tip. If you make a fist with your hand and you squeeze your hand really, really hard and you take your other finger and you want to press right between your thumb and your knuckle of your pointer finger. So that part, when you're cooking, this is where we touch meat, right, to see if that well done it is. If you squeeze your hand really, really hard and you touch this and you feel how taut that muscle is, if that is how tight you're holding your flowers, you are in you are going to have strain, not just in your hand, in your wrist and in your elbow. And this is what I developed many years ago, really severe tennis elbow. I had to get several cortisone shots in my arm. I was in a sling for a while, a lot of rehabilitation because I've made really, really dumb decisions with my, with my body over the years and abuse myself. Um, right. So you want to hold your hand loose. Right when you make when you make the spiral, the the beauty again of the spiral, and I sound like a, a you know like a robot just over and over. But the beauty of the spiral is that laying stems in at that forty five degree angle is actually locking them into place. I can set a spiral bouquet on the table and completely walk away without that a zero zero piece of tape, zero piece of wire, and come right back and pick it up, and I'm right back where I was because that spiral stem spiraling your stems is essentially the mechanic. It's locking that into place. It's actually your arm mature. And so you don't need to be over squeezing your bouquet. It's hurting your hand. It's hurting your wrist. It's hurting your elbow. And it's actually going all the way up into your shoulder, into your neck. So this is a really important mechanics issue with our body that we're not over squeezing and over holding. I literally hold my bouquet so open that sometimes things will just fall into the ground. That's how loose I'm holding it. And I'll just pick them up wow. and put them right back in. Right. I'm barely holding this thing together because the technique, the, te the mechanic of spiraling is actually what's holding it together. So check in with yourself. If you need to do some neck stretches, you need to check in on your arm. You need to lighten up a little bit. That might be helping. That might help minimize what's going on with pain. Very. I mean, I would have never have thought that we were going to be talking about pain and <laughs> All of that. So I'm pretty on a daily basis with myself. I still have my cupping marks for my acupuncturist over here. So I'm like very tuned in to like how we stand, how we design yeah. because I've dealt with some really serious injuries over the years, especially being an event production designer where you do a lot of overhead work and a lot of heavy schlepping. Um, you know, it really starts to take a toll. I've spent a lot of money on my body keeping it going over the years. And so I take that stuff really seriously that our form really matters in how we design. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. And this is just funny, so I want to share it. But Christina apparently has giant banana hands. <laughs> <laughs> she says, I have giant banana hands. 
it's not a huge issue for well, me. Lucky you. So. <laughs> I just envision all these banana fingers. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Um, okay, so I saw another question in here about spiral bouquet. So I think this is it. And I think you kind of answered it already. Mm -hmm. But um, Annie says, when you do, hold on, it's my die little height. When you do the spiral, um, what about at the end and you wrap the stems with ribbon? Doesn't the stems get all straightened and then all the flowers move vertically versus staying round in a shape? Can you repeat that? <laughs> Just she, I think she's concerned. She said, when you do a spiral, what about at the end and you wrap the stems with the ribbon, doesn't the stems get all straightened and then all the flowers move vertically versus staying in a rounder shape? Not in a spiral. Um, yeah. At the end of a spiral, you have essentially locked them into their little home, right? Mm -hmm. and you, you might have some... They might move in, you know, a quarter of an inch, but that really shouldn't be affecting the overall form of the bouquet. Um, at the very end, when you wrap the stems, it depends on how low you're wrapping. I only wrap and ribbon, you know, maybe an inch and a half. I don't go all the way to the bottom. But even if you were to go all the way to the bottom, um, you should still be able to maintain some of that form. If you do, though, squeeze all the stems all the way down, which I personally feel like is like a pretty, is kind of a dated way to wrap your bouquet. It also is really limiting. I mean, it could be a preference thing, but I'm going to give you some quick advice. I learned this from Nicola Camille in a bouquet workshop years ago. I thought it was life-changing for me. She cuts her handle so short. I'm talking like three inches. Like right. you do not see stems. And the reason she does this, I thought it was brilliant, is it forces the, the bride to sort of hold the bouquet, the face of the bouquet, a little bit more forward. So you actually see the outline of the form you built, not just this profile of it like a lollipop. It forces them to actually have it photographed in a much more um, sort of beautiful angle where a lot of the faces of the flowers are facing forward. This was a huge game changer for me because I, I always left a good chunk of stem and she just chopped them. And I was like, oh, you can do that. You know? <laughs> and ever since then, I've, always, I've only ever done that and it works really, really well. So what I do is travel with the bouquet. I have it wrapped at the basic wrap. I use, I use Oasis U glue dashes. I love them um, to secure the ribbon. Um, and I bring my tails separately and pin on my tails separately when I get there. So things aren't sloshing around in water. So I leave the stems nice and long. I get them there and then I, you know, get it out, dry it out. And then all I have to do is a quick pin because my I make my loops and ribbon um, on the, the bouquet pin. So it's already ready to go. You could pack them in a corsage box, a Tupperware. I would often just stick them in the back of my car, like on the head of the car seat, you know, right. and have a fabric car seat. So I would just stick them there. Um, and it worked out really, really well. That's good. And that answers Valerie's question too, about what you do after the bouquets and if you're yeah. placing them on water and all that jazz. So very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Yay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's let's dive into a little personal stuff. What is your most embarrassing bouquet fail? Someone wants to know. <laughs> so many. I mean, where do you even start when you've been designing a long time? You you have fail a lot, and that's good. <laughs> well, here's how we grow. There's nothing to be ashamed of about it. Okay, biggest biggest fail ever. This almost like this almost this one almost took me down. Uh, I had a bride from another coast was coming in, and she. Um, sends me the dreaded Pinterest board that has like 20 different inspi inspiration photos. And she's all over the place. She right. got engaged in Europe. So she wanted herbs, but then she wanted like this very sort of kitschy design. Like it was all over. So whenever you have this kind of client, right, what I make them do is make them make the tough decision. Like you, I need three pictures from you like max or one main photo, right? Or I'm going to make something like you got to really rein them in. So I thought I had done that, but you know, I thought I got it pretty close, got her what, her, what she wanted. That week at the LA flower market, this is back in LA. I, it was the worst week of the year. There'd been several floods between floods and heat. There was like zero peach, zero coral, right? Our dreaded coral flower. It's like you hear coral and just a chill shoots down your spine like, oh, coral. So she wanted coral. She wanted peach, all these tough, you know, orangey tones. And I'm at the mark. I cannot find a single 
thing. And it was a really small order, a low mint bouquet, one bouquet I had to make, one boutonniere, that's it. So it's just already not a very profitable way to do your work if you're a event florist, but she's a photographer. I thought I'm gonna get some good photos out of this and I made the made the call. Um, I had to call in every favor. I'm calling friends. Do you have anything on hand I can use? I mean, I'm in a full panic. They're like, there's nothing. It's been like this for a week and a half. There's nothing. I'm going to Trader Joe's. I'm driving around to Whole Foods. I'm at like some terrible little other wholesaler. I had literally been to six or seven places to try to pull together one bouquet. Wow. It was a nightmare because I literally could not find anything in this coat. And I didn't bother ordering because I thought, oh, this is easy. I'll just go to market, grab a few things, call it good. All right. So um, tried spray painting a few flowers, total failure. It did not look right. I was like, I can't deliver this to her. This doesn't work. Finally, I, I gather enough stuff, pull this thing off. I'm in tears. It's like two in the morning. I'm still fussing. My husband comes out. He's just like, it's good enough. Amy. you, you got it. You got to let it go. And I'm just like, it's <laughs> you know, I'm like, all terrible. I take all my work so personally, you know, I really yeah. like care about my brides, care about my work. So I really was devastated about not putting out a product I was proud of. Um, it was good enough though. So she shows up, she uh, looks in the cooler and she goes, oh, well, I, I like the orchid. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> But I had like randomly found a carnation. She wanted these really frizzy carnations. I mean, I really had worked hard to find her this such one. So she she's very sweet, gives me a big hug. We chit chat. I'm thinking, okay, this can't be too bad. She's not in tears. She's not throwing anything at me. I guess, I guess we're okay. Right. Um, I'm looking on her Instagram, searching high and low. Okay, I'm looking for photos of like her cool low mint. Nothing. No response. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And <laughs> I see... From a, I stalk because this is what we do when we start to spiral. I right. totally stalk all her friends' Instagrams because I'm like, what is going on? Why is she not responding? Why she must have hated this? And I see that she had was holding a completely different bouquet. She had somehow between LA and Palm Springs, which is a two-hour drive, had gone somewhere or either made something and and had gotten a completely different bouquet. That's how much she hated it. Oh my goodness. And Did I, she get the color she wanted? She got the color, but I got, no, it looked completely different than what she had originally wanted. It was very, all very confusing, but you know, I called a good friend. This is when your floral community really comes in handy, right? Is I called him and I was really crushed. She didn't even complain. She didn't ask for a refund. She just ghosted me. And at the end of the day, like, you know, you gotta let go. You do the best you can. You got, you do the best you can. But a man was, I devastated and um, it was embarrassing. I felt like, you know, it was just, it was just awful. But at the end of the day, you know, she got married and she was holding flowers and, you know, we don't nail it every time, guys. We don't nail it every time. Even the best of us don't nail it every time. And, you know, all we can do is keep showing up for our, ourselves and our clients and do the best work we can. And it, as embarrassing and sometimes humiliating as our mistakes can feel, um, we know we're not alone. And I got on the phone with a good friend and just kind of talked through it with her. She's been a florist for 20 years and she really talked me off the ledge. And it really was a time where I just really needed some perspective and just picked myself up. And I kept going. And I honestly, I posted on Instagram. I had so many people love this bouquet. I still have gotten comments on it. It's still on my Instagram. You can scroll back. It's like pink peonies, uh, light pink, frizzy, like very fuzzy carnations. It's got some olive in it. She wanted herbs in it. Right. She hated it. She hated it obviously so much that. Wow. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do at the end of the day? I know it's devastating. It literally feels like somebody has just like got you know knife to the heart, twisted. But you know, we all don't share the same taste. And what I think was was close to what she wanted, um, worked really hard to get it there. She didn't feel the same way, and so we have yeah. to move on. Yeah, exactly. What do you do? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can't believe it though. That's that's a really great story though. Thank you for sharing that with yeah, everyone. Totally. We can, I think, all relate somehow. <laughs> that story. Happens to all of us. Yes. Um, okay. So speaking of Instagram and pictures of a bouquet, someone wants to know what is the trick to make a bouquet look just as good in a photo as in real life, which can be tricky, especially with colors and things like that. Um, I, I photograph a lot of picture, like a lot of flowers for like our flower library and things like that. And 
there's some times where I'm like, I can't get the right color to like happen. So, and I know it's a lot more for you guys, a lot more than just about the color, but you know, yeah. How do you make it look so good? Um, well, the first thing is you have to have a good looking bouquet in person. <laughs> it's got to be designed well from all sides. If it's only got one good face and you have a photographer take a bunch of different shots of it and you're like, oh, that didn't look good from all the sides. Like we got to first make sure that the bouquet actually in three dimensional real life looks good from all the way around. Um, and so once that's accomplished, the photography actually is a lot easier because oftentimes, um, you know, at least the way I design my bouquets, they, they look good from all around. So whether I'm flipping it a little to the right or a little more to the right, and I can do a full 360 degree rotation, it should look appropriate all the way around. Right. And so both ways, I can hold it like a lollipop or face out. Um, and it really, you know, really does look fine all the way around. So um, my advice is to cut the stem short because you want the face of the bouquet facing forward. If she's holding it like a lollipop and there's just all this stem, all you see are the perimeter of half of that bouquet. You don't see all the faces of the roses, the faces of the peonies, all that beautiful layering you've done. You don't see it when it's just on its side. So you got to cut it short and it forces her to tilt the bouquet forward, right? That's really the trick is you want the bouquet tilted forward so that the face of it is being shot. Again, that is where all the money is. All right. the money is in those blooms, not on the little finishing bits that you put on the outer perimeter. So we really want to get to see that face. That's the trick. Very good. Very good. Um, we're getting towards the end here. Someone, I have another question from another viewer. How do you avoid the elements of the bouquet getting squished when putting in the vases for transporting? That's a, a good bouquet question. People get stressed out about moving them around. Yeah. So I think that's, a, is that a delivery, I think it's a delivery question. Maybe? Yeah. So yep, if you I use a delivery, floral delivery box, like one from Mayage, the long sort of shipping boxes, you just basically put the box back together. So the bottom is, you know, as if it, you basically have an empty box. Take a, you know, box cutter, you cut a couple of X's in the top, you know, space them out far enough. And you can just literally take your vase and pop it down in there with some tissue paper or um, even just by itself. And that keeps everything nice and tidy. You can also use things like um, crates or bus bins, or I love my Seminole floral delivery system. Um, I wish I had an affiliate link because I swear I have sold so many of those to people <laughs> over the years. But it's this tiny little company in Florida, a Seminole, Florida. This guy came up with this delivery system. I've been using it for years and it's my absolute favorite. So um, they're kind of these long, I have also a YouTube video on the how to use it and where to get them. But they're these kind of long things. So if you have a couple of bouquets that you're really worried about tipping over, I lock them into my Seminole floral delivery system because I drive like a crazy person. Like I take my corners hard. I mean, I have a straight up iron foot. So you know, I try to be more careful on wedding days, but you know, um, that thing has saved me. Even just yesterday, I did a, a brand new brand shoot and I, everything was in my Seminole delivery system. So I love that thing so much. But if you have a lot of bouquets, really the box tricks the best. You just make a big box and punch, punch holes in it. It's a great way to pack bouquets. Yeah, I love it. Good stuff. And I put the link for oh, yeah. the love video that there. Yeah. Um, I saw a couple of questions about trends. So Fleur Society was talking about long stems and how she's getting asks for those. Is that a new trend? And then someone else was just asking about general bouquet trends. What do you, what do you see or maybe want to see as trending for flower bouquets? Yeah, it's a new trend. I, it's a <laughs> interest and it's, you know, I, what I tell, what I try to tell brides or what I would tell brides right now is that, Although it seems cool and gathered, you know, there's a proportion issue. You know, you have to have a really big bouquet for the stems to look appropriately proportioned. It's what they want is that very gathered. It's kind of a French looking thing. And I, I totally get it. But in person, it doesn't look as good. Mm -hmm. I would personally get some pretty unflattering photos on like real wedding photos of people with gigantic grocery store looking stems and show them those because 
their like Pinterest inspired image. I mean, of course we give the, you know, we give the people what they want. This is a service industry. But it's also our job to guide them to not just be swept up in the technique and to get them the best image, right? And so if it's really kind of garish, we have to remind them this is a highly styled photo that was the perfect angle with a perfect edit with the perfect lighting and the perfect filter and right. her body shape and her dress that's what they're fantasizing about so i try to get to the root of like what that fantasy is about is it like you want this really gathered thing or you know if you want a more simplified bouquet let's do something like this it's more vertical but you know these like seven inch stem bouquets are just like i just don't know if you're gonna look back and be like that was beautiful right. um, so I try to advise them on their dress, what's appropriate with their dress, what's appropriate with the environment. Ta use design terminology like proportion and scale. This just helps people understand that you know what you're talking about and helps them like let you help them guide that decision. Um, it's not the end of the world, but I often tell them, you know, your dress you probably spent more money on it than the bouquet is my guess, right? And we want you and your dress to shine. The bouquet is an accessory. It's an accessory to your look, to your style. It's not the star of the show, in my opinion. So let's let your dress shine through. Let's let those really simple gather flowers. And just if they want really long stems, I wouldn't do it with roses or something really big and bulky. I would try to keep it as thin as possible um, and just, you know, keep the stems at different lengths and really make it look as kind of gathered. But I think it's a tough thing that I'm starting to see more of too. Yeah. Um, but trends I see in brocades are still loose and airy. I think it's making its way across the country. I think more in smaller, you know, towns or maybe smaller markets are starting to want the more open form style of design, more guarding, gathered, loose structured. They say lots of, you know, you'll hear about say, I want lots of greenery. I want lots of um, texture. I like all these little pretty, you know, things in here. So I think we're still moving away from, not not in all markets, there will always be a market and a bride for the more classic round bouquet. There's nothing wrong with that bouquet. That's what we envision a bouquet looks like since we're little tiny girls, right, getting married. So that's always going to be an ask of brides. Um, we need to know how to make that too um, to service our clients. But at the same time, I do think the open style is still trending. I think it's not going anywhere. I, I agree. And how, what do you feel about all the dried product that's popping up in bouquets and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I love it. I came from um, L.A. I was living in the desert for 10 years. So I was doing a lot of the dried grasses and boho stuff for a, a lot the last couple of years. I burned out pretty hard on Pampas, to be honest. I sort of saw, Pam you know, was deep in the Pampas world. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that it's still going strong and it's hitting mainstream in a big way. I was in anthropology recently and they're, you know, they have a, an entire dried floral bar. And when we know when it's hitting mainstream uh, retail, non-floral, we know that there, there's a trickle down here that's going to be around for a while. Yeah. So I think, you know, getting more comfortable with using dried product, understanding how to blend it with fresh so that it lives, be mindful of the smell. A lot of dry material is made with um formaldehyde that there, there can be really potent so you don't want to put that in somebody's bouquet bridal bouquet that i you know i wouldn't want them smelling that be mindful of dried versus preserved and things that are leaking dye can leak on a bride's dress if they get wet unless it's an all dried bouquet so uh it's we got to educate ourselves on this because this is a trend it's coming it's not going anywhere um it doesn't matter if we like it or we don't like it you know it's, people are asking for it so if you want to be competitive and I have to say, photographing the dried and preserved stuff, I do have to say a lot of the stuff comes in preserved that, that we bring in. There are some dried things, but it's a very small amount compared to what is preserved. Yeah. Um, and the stuff that is dyed, uh, like there, I was photographing, I think some things that were like red and pink and it like smudged on like my background. So I couldn't even, I was like, oh, you wouldn't ever want to go anywhere near a wedding dress. <laughs> it's literally the worst thing to happen um so yeah you got to be careful with with all the dyed stuff for sure but it is here to stay i mean and we see more and more demand i see yeah. questions about it all of the time all over the facebook groups and yep. um, instagram so yeah but it's yep. good all right well 
we're like, I feel like we're to, to the end. We didn't do too bad. We're <laughs> like about 15 minutes over, which isn't, isn't too terrible for us, I feel like. And it was such great content. But before we let everyone go, I know you have your bouquet boot camp coming up. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have uh, an online version too? So you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So a couple things, if you are feeling a little bit like, oh my gosh, I need help with bouquets, um, I'd love to help you. So we have a couple of options um, that I offer. So First thing I offer is virtual bouquet boot camp. So obviously with COVID, I'm not traveling anymore. I have no plans to get back on the road. Um, I also have a small child I'm homeschooling now. So <laughs> my life has changed just like everybody is and I'm not gonna be traveling the country doing workshops anymore. So I um, created virtual bouquet boot camp as a hands-on um, option where you get guidance and support through Zoom calls. So I know we're all like over the Zoom calls, but this has worked out really, really well. This will be our sixth sold out class um, in October. So I'm doing them roughly every two months. Um, the next one coming up is uh, December 2nd. Still um, several seats available. I just opened ticket sales a few days ago for that. So um, I typically have eight to 10 students. So we keep the class pretty small, pretty intimate. Um, I have uh, the flowers shipped directly to you um, I, with a curated palette that I create based on some of my you know, techniques and supply list, all my favorite um, mechanics, everything Amazon links included, as well as care and handling um, conditioning video of those specific flowers. So you really get everything you need to make some successful bouquets. I start up the class with uh, really foundational things. I do an hour and 15 minute lecture on design principles, color theory, as they apply to loose and airy bouquet making. So it's very, very niche down, very, very um, specific to the style of bouquet making that a lot more brides are asking for. Um, we do have a slightly more, you know, a classic style in the uh, cascade that we make. It's a little less like airy, but it's definitely still has some movement and uh, is all made in your hand. So we make a spiral bouquet, then we make an open form, loose and airy bouquet, and then we make a cascade hand tie. So you make two full bouquets, Classes are $500, and I schedule a follow-up call with all my students a couple weeks out to answer any questions and so forth. You also get the video content for three months after the class. So if you want to go back and rewatch things, if you're like, oh, I didn't take notes or my kid was crying, you can go back and rewatch. So it's a really helpful um, way to kind of get that hands-on experience that you may not be able to travel for. The other option is going to be my online course, Bouquet Bootcamp. It's going to be coming out hopefully later this year or early 2021. So this is just the actual content. It's not the hands-on. You can buy the course. It will be much, obviously, less expensive because we're not including flowers. Um, this will be great for students that live internationally that I can't ship flowers to. Um, and just great for people that maybe want to train their teams or have all this information um, as they may struggle with bouquets in the future. Um, it will be a very affordable option for people to learn all, everything we're talking about and more. So my full six-hour bouquet boot camp uh, broken into a course. And then, of course, one-on-ones. I've been, man, have I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one interest. So um, I have a small home-based studio here in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, I've had some students travel in from other states, but mostly a lot of local um, PA, Virginia, and Maryland. Um, and we just spend, a, you know, usually one or two days working on just about everything under the sun, whether it's wiring techniques, social media strategy, mindset, bouquet making, building speed. Some of my designers are really skilled, but they really struggle with speed. So we build efficiencies. I really study what they're doing, really create a really customized design experience for the student to grow. That's really the objective is to get them to hit those, those goals and objectives. So absolutely love working with students one-on-one. -on -one. We can make so much progress in even nine, 10 hours. It's amazing how much we can get done. So um, those are the three offerings I have. And I'm really excited to be able to, you know, keep sharing this information and just helping more students become more confident in their bouquet making. Yeah, I love it. And so for anyone that wants to get more information about those options that you just talked about, they just go to Amy Nicole Floral. Amy Nicole Floral .com. Yep. And like I said, I'll be launching my new brand at the end of the month. You can get on my email list to get um, special discounts. I also have a free Facebook group um, for florists. So I, I often will do like free videos in there sometimes, or, Hey guys, I'm going to make this. Let me show you how to do this. So you can join my free Facebook group. The only requirement for joining Facebook is that you do flowers. <laughs> you do some type of flowers. You can be a hobbyist, but you can't, you know, just, you know, 
you got to be someone in the floral world to, to hang out with us in there. Um, YouTube's another great resource. I'm on Pinterest, but mostly on Instagram. But um, jump on my email list. You'll be notified of everything that rolls out. I offer special discounts and first ticket sales there and everything like that. So um, thanks, Deb Glickman. Yes, Deb was one of my one-on-one -on -one students. Thanks for mentioning that, Deb. Um, yeah, so please come and uh, hang out with me. It'd be awesome. I love it. Yes. Thank you so much, Amy. This was amazing. I really appreciate your time and joining us today. Um, we had so much fun talking about social media, guys. And if you haven't heard that one, it is almost two hours long because there's so much to talk about in one hour. It's impossible. We tried it. So um, be sure you check that out because there's lots of good stuff there, too. And I hope that we get to do this soon again. Anytime. Anytime. So happy. Thanks. Always an honor to be on Mayish. So thank you guys for having me. Oh, thank you. You're really lovely and so intentional. I, I talk about that all the time. I love how you speak because it's so it's coming from your heart and it's no, it's just very organized. I love it. I love the way you speak. So you're a really great educator and, and just honored to be able to work with you here oh. and there. <laughs> well, you made my day. Thank you for uh, coming too. Thanks for, for joining. I this was a long, long one. You guys just thanks for being here. Your time is valuable and appreciate yeah. you listening. I know. Yeah. Thanks, guys. This is a wrap on today's mornings with Mayish. Afternoon with Mayish now. Um, and again, thanks for spending the last hour with us. It was amazing. Our next scheduled show is for Wednesday, November 11th at 2 p.m. I'm going to have Nicole Clary of Nicole Clary Photography and Logan Martin of Good Notion. And we are going to be talking about visual storytelling with photos and video. So really good. If you guys have questions about upping your own photo and video game, um, they're going to help you with that along with talking about different things from their perspective as well. So I'm really excited about that show. I hope you join me. And if you guys have questions about that, please send in your questions via email, DM, however you want to. Um, and that's it, guys. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you all soon. Take care.